Okay, so today I'm going to share with you the, um, the, share with you the understanding of what is epigenetic therapy and why we're interested in it for cancer treatment. So if we go back to the beginning, to the slide that Sue showed, looking at the epigenome landscape, to date the best of the studied of the epigenetic mechanisms, as we understand, are DNA methylation, which is the addition of the methyl group to the cytosine base, and the histone modifications. And by that we mean the DNA wrapped on the bees and the string. And why we're interested in, and why it's so important is it determines whether the chromatin is open and genes are turned on or it's closed and genes are turned off. So if we focus in here on DNA methylation in cancer, what you see here is a normal cell and you see the, um, the white lollipops indicate an unmethylated base and the important thing is in a normal cell, these regions that are unmethylated, the gene is turned on. But what we know from our research is that in the cancer cell, these marks are dramatically changed. And what you see here is that a region which is unmethylated in a normal cell gains DNA methylation. It gains these marks on top of the DNA and the gene becomes turned off. So a key question we and many others around the world have had for a long time is to say, can we reverse epigenetic alterations in cancer? So if we go back to the picture of the normal cell, unmethylated, and the cancer cell, methylated, the question that we've been asking is, can we reverse the cancer methylation pattern to a more normal cell pattern? And so there's been a great interest to find drugs or therapies that can actually do this. And this is what we call epigenetic therapy. So epigenetic therapy is therapy or drugs that can reverse these epigenetic patterns or changes that we observe in diseased cells. So why are we particularly interested in epigenetic therapy? As you well know, cancer is a collaboration between our genetics and our epigenetics. We also know from our research in the last decade or so that many of the genetic mutations in cancer in fact affect the genes which control our epigenetics. So there's cross-talk between our genetics and our epigenetics. We know that we can't change our genetic patterns. We can't change these mutations. But epigenetics offers us the opportunity to modulate these changes. So by epigenetic therapy, we hope to be able to re-pattern the epigenome profile to a more normal cell-like state. So if we consider our best studied epigenetic mechanisms, as in DNA methylation and the histone modifications, these two well-studied epigenetic mechanisms on our DNA, in fact, offer us opportunity for epigenetic therapies. And to date, the most advanced and the clinically most validated of the epigenetic therapies target DNA methylation and target the histone changes. So what is the process for epigenetic drug development? So this is just to give you an idea of the, um, the journey that, we, that it takes to, to, to do this. So initially there's the, is the identification of a molecule, a drug screen. This very much happens in the laboratory using cell lines. And the cells are assessed for how well they're growing, how they respond to the drug, and we do epigenetic profiling to assess what effect this is having on the cells. Drugs that have an effect of inhibiting the cell growth or look promising, are then moved into what we call preclinical testing. And this is testing that happens using mice models, again in a laboratory setting. But here we're able to test toxicity, validity of the, the approach. And drugs which show promise at that stage, molecules that are, look like they are having an inhibitory effect on the cells, can then be moved through into clinical studies. And clinical studies journey through Phase one, which are generally assessing doses, into phase two, and then into much larger clinical trials, which are the phase three clinical trials. And finally, when a drug has 
found to be fishes working, they validated it, um, it will be approved by regulatory authorities such as the FDA, the Food and Drugs Administration. So what I show you here, I go back now to DNA methylation and what we know and has been well, have been validated, clinically validated, what I show you here are three um, examples of DNA methylation inhibitors which are now in clinical, have been clinically validated. The first two are in clinical use. The third molecule there is, um, is showing great promise and it is in phase three trials. So these DNA methylation inhibitors block DNA methylation. So in that way, they remove those DNA methylation marks to revert to a more unmethylated um, structure. And this is um, just to give you a flavor for some of, some of the work that's happening. So this is a table showing you some of the DNA methylation inhibitors that are, in, um, that are being used. In particular, 5-azocytidine. Um, this was approved in 2004 for MDS, leukemia. And the second one, decitabine, which is 5 as a deoxycytidine, which was approved for MDS in 2006 and has had significant impact on improved outcomes for patients. And the point of, and what I also show in this in table is that there are other drugs coming through. So there you can see the SG1110, which I showed on the previous slide. Um, is in phase two trials, um, as is the DHAC. So if we turn our attention now to the histone inhibitors. So the histone marks on top of the histones are brought about by proteins, and we have a number of different players here. So writers will add a mark to the histones, erasers will remove the mark, and readers bind to these marks and interpret the mark on top of the histone tails. So of course all these, the writers, the readers, the, the erasers, provide us with opportunity to target these protein players. And so we have what we call generally as inhibitors of these of histone changes. And this is a very big long table, but it was again just to give you an idea of histone inhibitors that are being used for cancer treatment. I highlight in the top drugs that have been approved for treatment, primarily in the leukemias, the blood cancers, um, but you see the, the, some, some examples where we're actually using these drugs for other cancers. And what you can see is the enormous number of drugs which are still coming through in phase two and phase one clinical trials. And this really just gives you a, a, screen, a shot of a view of, of what is happening around the world in terms of the cancers which are being are in trial at different stages, phase one, phase two, phase three, um, with these different epigenetic therapies. Um, the leukemias and the lymphoma, they have, they're the most clinically advanced in terms of epigenetic therapy. Um, more challenging has been the use of epigenetic therapy with solid tumors, but there's certainly a huge effort worldwide to now um, validate and make progress in that area. And I just wanted to share with you some of data from our own, our own experiments that we've been doing here. This is showing you a, a patient-derived mouse model, and what you see on the y-axis is tumor size, on the x-axis is days of treatment. So we've been looking to see how the, the epigenetic therapy is working in the solid tumor. The vehicle is the untreated control, and if you compare that to the blue line, which is where we have treated these mice with epigenetic therapy, what you can see is a dramatic change in the volume size of the tumor. So that's very exciting data to see this effect of the decitabine treatment. And what I show you here on the right-hand side um, is the top panel shows brown dots. Now that is a stain that we use to look at actively growing cells. And you can see they're growing very well in the vehicle or the control. If you compare it to the lower panel, you can see how significantly reduced the little brown dots are. 
So the actively dividing cells are significantly reduced. And this is a consequence of the epigenetic therapy. So where to next? I've spoken today mostly about generation one and generation two of our epigenetic therapies. Certainly moving forward, there's enormous interest, and we believe that the impact of epigenetic therapies will be in combining them with immunotherapy and with chemotherapy. And we certainly know that epigenetic therapies seem to stimulate an immune response. So it segues well with this idea of combining these therapies. And with Generation 4 will be is even more specific targeting. So if you remember the readers and the writers and the erasers of histomarks, will be specifically targeting those different genes and proteins. And finally, this is my last slide, um, just to share with you that we're really very excited to be um, part of the epigenetic dream team, which is part of Stand Up to Cancer, through um, our new members, through Sue Clark and um, Professor Anthony Joshua here at the Garvin. We're now part of this, part of this group. Um, this is led by Professor Balin and Professor Jones in the States. And it's particularly exciting. We're looking to get preliminary data to show the effect of epigenetic therapy in breast cancer and hope in the not-too-distant future to be bringing those clinical trials here to St. Vincent's. Thank you.